to keep that uh, group on, huh? mm -hmm. if there are any problems in the room. Like for the first session, you do next session, I will check, huh? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We will be starting with our first technical session of the day. The theme of this session is agriculture and food processing. This is the seventh technical session of the second SCO Young Scientist Conclave. And this session will be chaired by myself, Dr. Shimantini Majumdar, DST postdoc in CPMU JNCSR, and Ms. Mallika Bhatt, PhD student in MBJU uh, JNCSR. The audiovisual team for this session is Ankit, Kuku, and Irene. And the faculty chairs for this session are Dr. Kesavan Subaharan, principal scientist of ICAR in BAIR, Bengaluru, and Dr. V. Sridhar, principal scientist of ICAR. IIHR Bengaluru. So let's begin with our session, Agriculture and Food Processing. Agriculture and food processing are the predominant sectors in the overall economic development of the SEO countries. It is considered as the most extensive private enterprise, sustaining millions of farm families and engaging more than 50% of the workforce. This sector has also been well recognized for alleviating poverty, hunger, and malnutrition, and inclusive economic development. This session of the conclave focuses on agrarian innovations, new opportunities for accelerating gains in productivity, profitability, sustainability, equity, and inclusivity. Advancement in agricultural and food processing embraces the green to gene revolution, genetic resource management and utilization, speed breeding, omics, and bioinformatics. The convergence of agriculture, engineering, and digital technologies would further revolutionize future agriculture. Agriculture and food processing have been introduced as a thematic area for this conclave to deliberate, foster, and proliferate groundbreaking ideas for probable future alliances amid the SEO member states. So today's theme is divided into two sessions. The first one before the tea break and the other one will be continued after the break. 
we would like to inform you that during the talks, both offline and online, we will stream your video in parallel with your slides. We have already acquired all your presentations with the audio and video embedded. And if you are here in person, please raise your hand after your name is announced so that our, our camera can capture you. At the end of each session, we have organized a question and answer session that has been allotted for around 10 minutes so that we will take all the questions that pertain to the session. So for asking your questions, the participants who are present here can raise your hands and our volunteers will come to you with the microphone. For the online participants, you can just type your questions if you have any along with the speaker's name to whom your questions are directed in the chat box and our audio visual team will lay the questions to ask the chairs. So let's start with the first speaker of this session. Our first speaker is Bakirov Sergei Mudarisovich, who is an associate professor at Saratov State Agrarian University, Russia. And the title of his talk is Polygon of Advanced Development in Land Reclamation. I request our speaker to please raise your hand so that our can camera can capture you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the participants of the conclave uh, of young uh, saints of the SQO member states. My name is Sergei Bakirov. Uh, I am from Saratov, Russia. Thank you, India, for the opportunity to participate personally in uh, this scientific event. Uh, we are uh, engaged in the digitalization of agricultural production, namely crop production. Uh, when uh, performing any operation, a number of uh, important parameters or forms that uh, require uh, in-depth analysis. Through the joint uh, efforts of our regional institutions, it has been established that over the past 50 years, there uh, has been an increase in dry and very dry land by almost 14%. This uh, directly affects the quality of the fault layer and frozen and the yield. This problem can be solved only with the help uh, of systematic long-term uh, monitoring of changes in soil parameters under the influence of various factors. To achieve uh, this our Wavila University uses a ground uh, for advanced de development in the field uh, of mineration and irrigation. Uh, at the test site, we uh, conduct research at various levels. Uh, many teachers from different faculties are involved in uh, agronomers, uh, land reclamators, electricians, mechanic engineers. For example, my team uh, in 2022 uh, was uh, implementing a new irrigation method uh, based uh, on data from soil moist, moisture and uh, temperature sensors installed at different depths of the plant rat layer. Uh, in this uh, case, the micro relief uh, of the area is of great importance. Uh, we have established patterns of changes in the uh, content of 
në entrellët që gjem për të sem, so dem in the soil under the influence of irrigation. Vitot neural network to predict the date of the next watering, taking into account the smallest and sufficient number uh, of sensors uh, in the field, which uh, is covered by one sprinkler. Within the framework of the federal program of strategic and academic readership priority 2040, we are implementing an irrigation robotization project, uh, which consists of uh, controlling the speed of movement of the sprinkler, irrigation rates for each sector of the field, regulation of pump parameters, etc. Uh, students uh, are particularly involved in scientific activities, uh, which are the main force driver of the scientific de development using new tropes and ideas. A large number of uh, students are involved in the implementation of a mega project uh, of uh, accelerated uh, selection and seed production and irrigation, uh, the task of which is to develop a new production of seeds of crops with a high protein content. For a wide coverage of aspirations, uh, we are equally uh, actively engaged in the development of land reclamation, uh, introducing our know-how into production. Uh, this uh, major research project is uh, being launched uh, to create a floating laboratory for studying hydrology object. Uh, thus, the strategic task uh, and our mission is to preserve the fertile layer uh, which burst uh, out and uh, depletes every year. Uh, related tasks are to increase the yield by 2-4 times of popular agricultural crops, uh, soybeans, corn, uh, lentils, etc. Uh, prevent drought uh, and the development of adverse processes in the soil, energy savings uh, and resource saving in the field of agricultural production. Thank you for attention. We are glad to cooperate and are ready to cooperate in solving common tasks. Thanks, Dr. Bakirov, for your very nice presentation. Join me in thank you, our speaker. Now we will move forward to our next talk of this session. Our next speaker is Linda Vincent, who is a scientist Greetings at Indian Institute of Horticultural Research, India. The title of her talk is Biotic Stress Breeding in Grapes and Pomegranate Hessen through Omics Research. Approach. I request our speaker to please raise your hand so that our camera can capture you. I am Dr. Linda Wilson, scientist in the Institute of Horticulture Research, presenting on the topic Biotic Stress Breeding in Grapes and Pomegranates, Season 3 of the Package. Grapes and Pomegranates are two major export food crops from India. At the same time, these two crops are infected with diseases. Grapes disease called Downy Nitrate, caused by Plasmopyra vitricola, 
and concurrently ATK is also the bacterial model by code by Sandomanus actinopodes for the work clinically. This requires large amount of pre and post infection chemicals, dumping tons of fungicides and bacteriocytes in and also cause of uh, environmental pollution, development of resistance, respiratory toxicity, which leads to human concern. Among all the approaches, conventional breeding approach is the major sustainable approach in local regions, taking advantage of immune resistance from American and Asian wildlife species in place and URDA collection 99A is complement. We are focusing on the PTI trigger genes and ETA genes that are our genes uh, for introducing these genes. Conventional breeding takes decades to evolve these uh, hybrids development in place, especially around the 6,000 hybrids are developed through this approach, but it takes many decades to develop. Meanwhile, on this approach, we are in this process through early selection, large population screen, as well as uh, with great accuracy. First one is the phenomic approach. In Greece, there are techniques developed to assess the disease through macroscopic and microscopic infection, image based and metabolic properties. Traditionally, we go for naked eye evaluation of disease at foliage and cluster level. To more precision, in vivo artificial inoculation for the cuttings in greenhouse condition, ex vivo artificial inoculation in controlled growth chambers, and recently, deep disc bio -artists. An in vitro assessment method also followed. This uh, picture is shown in the with bio -assessment. Other observation is through image based stains and ultrastructural analysis to increase the accuracy and precision and also this non destructive method. Here, using digital photographs and also AI video network, early identification of the disease can be possible. Uh, and also by staining methods, which include the ambient blue fluorescence and the really staining, uh, especially in uh, Dummy and DB are using this one, these also can be used as a omic approach. Third phenomic approach is metabolic profiling. Already identified compounds and activities can be used to post treatment large number of hybrids to cut down the population size. There are some examples in fields like Phenyl carbonyls, uh, delta ethyl, as well as uh, some of the phenyl compounds like uh, tartaric acid, tartaric acid, and etc. This is to screen residents in hybrid. Second important on this approach is genomics. Initially, we can go for characterization of genetic resources to know genetic variation for this particular disease, thereby identifying the parents or social traits. Uh, actually, in case of Greece, already identified as a star after the disease triple, are there to screen the germplasm as well as its cause. Uh, in Tonkin, they are able to identify some of the markers to use as a genome approach. Home genome physical map of Greece available in public domain, while Greece Retention Project has gone on using single molecule layer genome for the complete determination of genome and identify putative resistant genes that we can see very as well as embryos RG present. Also, we can go for a genotype limited organization uh, approach to the Q-genome concept. Q-genome of grapevine dominant resistant traits are available. One can use in the OMIS approach for speed gain. Last OMIS approach is transform of epidemic. Here we will see the gene expression analysis of crop and disease interaction through two RTPs here, or which are the genes that are limited or damage related upon infection and resistance and susceptible uh, germplasm or the hybrids. Uh, some of the examples are actually utilized uh, through. And this can be practically utilized for making markers related to upregulated genes or signal cartilage. And also the development of microbial cultivation with a linear extent in the source also similar to transitomics, codon studies also can be done. Few advanced nuclear by RP1 and RP3 for regulation of the large end, protein resistance to cell death, reactive optimization and plasmonic processes were added. In concurrence, uh, copper binding proteins uh, proposed uh, to be action were also identified 
and also drawing and application application of the proteins are also To conclude this definition, uh, rather than going with the single application taking program, development of many number of things approach has been the past of uh, hybrid project development as well as fashion reducing process and tangible design for raising. Thanks, Dr. Linda, for a very nice presentation. Before proceeding to the next talk, there is a small announcement. We found this diary in the auditorium yesterday evening. So, uh, if it's yours, please contact us in the tea time. So, let's proceed to our next talk of this session. Our next speaker is Bappa Das, who is a scientist at the Natural Resource Management Section, ICAR, Central Coastal Agricultural Research Institute, Old Goa, India. The title of his talk is Synergy of Optical, Thermal and Microwave Remote Sensing for Surface Soil Moisture. I request our speaker to please raise your hand so that our camera can take you. Honorable Chairperson of this session, Co-Chairperson, Distinguished Delegates, and my dear friends, a very good morning to you all. I welcome you all to my presentation on Synergy of Optical, Thermal, and Microwave Remote Sensing for Surface Soil Moisture Mapping. Spatial mapping of surface soil moisture is extremely important for agricultural decision making like sowing, irrigation, fertilization, etc. So, real-time mapping of soil moisture is of utmost important. However, the challenge lies on utilizing near real-time satellite observation to translate it into soil moisture. Microwave remote sensing, which is a all-weather and day-night capable, but has coarser spatial resolution. On the other hand, optical and thermal remote sensing can map the surface soil moisture at spatial Final resolution, but are limited by cloud cover, vegetation, and light conditions. So, the synergy of optical, thermal, microwave provide more frequent monitoring of soil moisture over farm or field scale. Keeping these above facts in view, we hypothesize that a combination of optical, thermal, and microwave remote sensing can give a reliable estimates of soil moisture by overcoming the disadvantages of single technique at spatial and temporal scales suitable for agricultural operations. With the objective to derive near surface soil moisture information from integration of optical, thermal, and microwave remote sensing sensors using machine learning models. For digital soil moisture mapping, we have collected optical and thermal data of Landsat 8 operational land imager that is OE and thermal infrared sensor. And also we have collected microwave data of Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture. The OLE provides reflectance in various bands which were used to calculate 22 vegetation indices. The tree span was used to derive land surface temperature. The backscatter coefficients in vertical, vertical and vertical horizontal polarizations were derived from Sentinel-1 data. In synchrony with the satellite overpass over the study area, we have collected soil moisture using Theta probe sensor through field survey. The modern data was split into two parts. 70% of the total data set was used for calibration, while the rest 30% was used for validation. We have developed the models in two levels. At level 1, random forest cubist and gradient basically machines were trained using calibration data set, while the beta learning model that is elastic net was used at level 2 to combine the results of multiple base learners at level 1 to generate the final output, that is the surface soil moisture map. The final output generated from these models were validated using the test data set. We have collected 622 observations, out of which 434 were used for calibration, while 100, 
88 observations were used for validating the model. The equality of means, variances, medians, and distributions between calibration and validation datasets were tested using T, F, Man Whitney, and Colbo Block summing of tests respectively, which indicated that the datasets were identical with T values more than 0.05. These are some of the thematic maps of covariates used for digital soil moisture mapping like normalized difference vegetation index, sigma or VB that is backscatter coefficient in particle, particle polarization, land surface temperature, and normalized difference water index. The results showed that among the best models at level 1, random forest perform the best both during calibration and validation with R square of 0.95 and 0.71 respectively. Stacking of individual models significantly reduced the model errors in terms of mean bias error from 0.49 to 0.18 and root mean square error from 5.17 to 5.03. These machine learning models are basically back box models, but we can unlock them through the plotting of variable importance. And the variable importance plot showed that normalized difference water index with modification was the best variable identified by GBM and random forest, while it was the second most important variable found by QBIST. Backscatter coefficient, that is sigma naught in vertical vertical polarization, was another most important variable. LST appears as a key variable in GBM and RF, but with less importance in QBIST. The digital maps of surface soil moisture generated through RF revealed that on 30th October, most of the fields were dry with low moisture content, as it was a fallow period with most of the fields were vacant. On 24th November, the most of the patches were having moderate to high moisture content coinciding with showing off with crop. Slightly drier conditions were found during 17 December and 27 January. Higher surface soil moisture content was again recorded during 19 February coinciding with flowering of wheat crop, which is the most critical stage for irrigation. Most of the fields were found dry during 24 March with maturity of crops when the irrigations were seized. So our models were able to capture the SSM variability very well. Similar patterns were found for gradient boosting mapping and QBIST also with stake ensemble modeling. So from this study, the following conclusions can be drawn like spatial patterns of surface soil moisture were found mostly similar across the machine learning models and the stack ensemble model. Stacking of input from individual model outputs improved the potential of soil moisture retrieval by reducing overfitting and individual model biases. Overall, the study demonstrated the competence of digital soil moisture mapping by achieving high predictive accuracy and providing valuable outputs for supporting agricultural irrigation scheduling and management at field scale. The approach, however, can be limited by the availability of microwave and optical thermal data at the same time. I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Devasi Chakraborty, ICAR IRI, ICAR Central Coastal Agricultural Research Institute, ICAR for providing the fellowship. Thank you one and all for your patient listening. Thanks, Dr. Bappa, for your very nice presentation. So now we are proceeding to our next speaker, and our next speaker is Kalurski Evgeny Sergevich, who is an associate professor at Cook State Agricultural Academy, Russia. And the title of his talk My is Restoration and Hardening of Agricultural Machinery Parts with Composite. Unfortunately, our speaker is uh, not well today and is unable to join us. Uh, so let's go ahead and listen to his presentation. My name is Evgeny Kalutsky. I am from Kursk Agricultural Academy in Russia. Dear organizers and participants of the second conclave on young scientists, let me present you to my report in, on the topic restoration and hardening of agricultural machinery parts 
with composite electrodeposited coating based on electroerosive hard alloy powered material of micro and nano fractions. Currently, renovation technologies for defective parts of agricultural machinery are among the most resource saving as compared to the manufacture of new parts. Costs are reduced by 70%. One of the main sources of resource saving is the cost of materials. On overage, the cost of materials in the manufacture of parts is 38% and the restoration 6% of the total cost. The cost of ensuring the operability of agricultural machinery over the entire service life are several times harder than the cost of the manufacture. When restrong worn parts, it becomes necessary to find new, more advanced methods of restoration and could increase the life of parts at relatively low costs. One of such technological solutions is composite electrodeposited coating based on electroerosive, in particular hard alloy powered materials of micro and nano fraction. On this basis, the aim of the work is to develop and study the process of restoring and hardening parts of automotive equipment with composite galvanic coating based on electroerosive hard alloy powered materials of micro and nano fractions. In accordance with the goal, it is necessary to solve the following talks with the presence on the slide. The processes that occur during the electrodeposition of non ferrous metal weights and alloys, alloys proceeds in the interelectrode space field with a working field, which has physical, chemical and mechanical effects on the process, electrodes, granules and erosion production of the alloy, which affects all stage of the process. Electrodispersion of metal weights is carried out on an experimental installation, the scheme of which is present on the slide. A very important characteristic of dope fine particles is their size and shape. Analysis of shape parameters of electroerosive charged particles indicates that the electroerosive particles have a spherical and elliptical shape. The process of rapid crystallization of the molten material in a liquid working medium contributes to giving the particles the shape of a sphere and an ellipse. It has been experimentally established that electroerosive particles can have size from 0.25 to 100 microns, as shown in the graph. The conducted experimental studies have shown that the particle size distribution on the particles of the electroerosion charts is significantly affected by the properties of the working fluid in which the electroerosion process takes place. The figure shows the result of studying the granulometric composition of particles obtained the electrodispersing metal waste in distillate water. As shown by the results of analysis of spectrograms of elemental composition when dispersing metal waste in distillate water, oxygen is detected on the surface of dispersed particles and all the other elements are disturbed relatively evenly. When dispersing metal waste in kerosene, excess carbon is found on the surface of dispersed particles. Analysis of phase composition of electroerosion charts has shown that the presence of carbon in the working fluid promotions the formation of carbide phases, and its absence leads of, to the formation of oxide phases. The difference of phase composition is electroerosive charge is associated with the difference of chemical composition of working fluids that provide oxygen and carbon supply to the reaction zone melt zone. Deposition of electrochemical coating with the addition of electroerosive materials has been carried out on a galvanic installation, the scheme of which is shown in on the slide. The results of preliminary studies have shown the effect of technological parameters of electrodeposition of electroerosive particles on the composition, structure and properties of the obtained composite electrochemical coating. Analysis of the microstructures has shown that the coating have no visible defects at the coating substrate boundary, have a dense non-porous structure and the pores of the substrate are evenly filled with the composite coating with the addition of electroerosion particles, which in associate with the presence of small fractions of electroerosion charged particles. In Good morning, dear friends. It's my pleasure to, to attend. Thanks to Dr. Kalursky for a very nice presentation. 
Our next speaker is Aimin Shi, who is a professor at Institute of Food Science and Technology, Chinese Academy of Agricultural yes. Sciences, Beijing, China. And the title of his talk is Peanut Quality Evaluation and Processing and Utilization Technology and Equipment. I request Dr. Aimin to please switch on his video. I request Dr. Aimin to please switch at this. Distinguished conference president and committee, leaders and friends, it's really my honor to share some latest research progress on peanut processing technology. I'm Amin Shi, came from Institute of Food Science and Technology, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Culture Sciences. The title of my report is Peanut Quality Evaluation and Processing, Utilization Technology and Equipment. This is the main contents. The first part, I want to show the background. In 2022, the total yield of peanut in the world reached uh, 50 million tons, with China accounting for 36.4% for of the world's total per production, ranking first in the world, and the peanut production of four main Africa countries accounts about 20 of the world's total production. It's a, it is worth a huge production. And there are many peanut varieties and uh, grand pensions resources in the world. For example, in China, we have about uh, uh, 8,000 peanut strings and about uh, 1,300 main varieties. Uh, this, this situation is worth the same in other countries. Peanuts are used and cons consumed in very various ways around the world. Among them, the main um, cattle grace including oil pressings, uh, peanut butter, sack food, uh, export trade, seeds for last year, China and India is quite quite same, while US and EU is similar. Next, I will report the main research progress in our group. First is the technology and equipment for rapidly and non destructively detecting peanut quality. As I said before, we have a lot of varieties and there are significant differences in raw materials processing uh, characteristics. When we want to determine these characteristics, the normal methods are expensive, uh, slow, uh, slow analysis speed, uh, com compression, press treatment. So we have used uh, an IRS as a key theory to see it is possible to for rapid determination in multiple level with the multiple uh, overtone and the combination uh, vibrations could represent a different structure. And compare Compared with the conventional um, approaches, NIR have many benefits like it means the uh, creator rail of being accurate, reliable, rapid, low, non-destructive, and inexpensive. Meanwhile, the NIR equipment is moving towards portable. Based on this theory and advantages, we set this strategy to and build the relationship between the chemical data and the spectral spectral data. On the, this basis, we have invented portable and rapid detector for peanut quality, peanut one point zero. Meanwhile, for different application and scan net narrows. We have also developed the spectrum cup for mass sample test and a single kernel sensor array for single uh, kernel test. Little um, conclusion, our equipment is Thanks, Dr. Aymin, for your nice presentation. Our next speaker is Shamsi. High three uh, throughputs, fast speed, the detecting facial inwards, 
300 times higher than the low chemical method. Our equipment show high occurrence um, results. It's more than 96%. Uh, more important is portable uh, module screen, uh, uh, multi sense uh, application, and could be used everywhere. The second type of technology is the processing characteristics and quality evaluation technology or peanuts. In different countries, the special varieties for peanut processing is uh, uh, urgent, but the traditional approach is more uh, empirical. Uh, however, to expand, uh, how to expand, expand a uh, scientific system of methods is uh, critical. The main strategy of our technology is find out the relationship and build the model between the varieties and peanut food products. Then is SPH evaluation standard and the basic database. Database. In this way, we could result into a series of special varieties for peanut processing. On the basis, we first build the relationship model between the peanut quality and peanut products quality by uh, supervised pro uh, principal uh, components regulation of uh, analysis and varied by other peanut varieties. At the basic of peanut products properties analysis, the grading uh, standard uh, of peanut products was established by uh, cluster analysis according to the relationship model of peanut varieties and products. The evaluation, evaluation standards of peanut quality should Scheduled uh, to process words and spat and spat Finally, the basic uh, database of peanut processing quality or SPH uh, is now including uh, 182 per peanut varieties, 1, um, 50, 50, 15,000 and 429 dates, and words will be further added and expanded. In the conclusion, for example, when we want to evaluate the suitability of one peanut variety to processing protein with geo properties, the main step is like this. We should determine, determine the relationship and uh, the content of protein and arginine and use the mathematical model and standard to find out if it is suitable or unsuitable. The third technology is comprehensive evaluation of peanut and its byproducts. In this part, I want to share its, uh, it is a series of technology and it can be used on alone, work form and industrial, industrial chain with different inputs. About peanut oil, we have developed a lot of high quality peanut oil processing preparation technology like uh, NOR. Uh, temperature processing peanut oil. It has high quality not only in color, uh, less uh, anti nutritional factors, but also retain nutritional factor to the maximum extent like sterols. More important, this technology makes the peanut protein after oil process with no degree of uh, deterioration and is possible to follow processing. This is the virgin high oil peanut oil, as I said in the former slide. The, um, Oleic acid show lots of functional properties and activities. We also have proved that this oil can prevent uh, metabolic, metabolic uh, central trauma. And basically, based on this research, research results, uh, this working high oleic acid peanut oil is very marketable. About peanut snack food today, I want to show you a new technology named the sand skimmed peanut percent method. In technology could reduce the fat content by 50% and keep the original uh, cheap flavor. On this uh, basis, basis, we could develop the semi uh, skimmed uh, grapey peanuts, semi degreased uh, peanuts, and other products. Uh, less fat, more healthier, longer shelf life. About the peanut butter, I want to show you is the high quality peanut butter percent technology. The main bro uh, breaks uh, three, including the green that we developed the quality evaluation standard of peanut butter. Then we can then we screen out eight special varieties suitable for peanut butter processing and then establish uh, the special percent technology. On this basis, uh, we, our peanut butter is uh, uh, compatible with commercially available products like uh, Chief with better flavor and taste, and longer shelf life and uh, high profit. About peanut protein, it's worth uh, 
the focus of our team's uh, scientific research in the next 10 years, we have developed local processing technology and local products like low temperature processed peanut meal, peanut tofu, peanut powder, peanut uh, protein concentrate, peanut components, peanut oligopeptides. Among these texture products uh, were so called peanut, uh, peanut protein based meal. Uh, it is also uh, very, very hot in China or over the world. In this direction, we have many technology and new products based on high moisture extrusion. Besides, we have also established a number of bioproducts comprehensive refrigeration technology, like from skin, leaf, hair, wine skin, red skin, roots, and throats. We could actually a lot of functional active ingredients. For in the meal, we have uh, taught, have taught many more about uh, more temperature meal and uh, for high temperature high temperature meal we have developed the, the technologies for uh, for the wood adhesive it could play an important role in new energy and development production. This is war and thanks for your attention. Sorry for stopping the presentation in between. Um, the online participants could not hear the speaker. That's why we had to pause in the middle. Thank you so much for understanding. Let's thank Dr. Ayamin for his uh, nice presentation. So let's proceed to our next Good morning. speaker. Our next speaker is Shamsiev Anwar Agvarovich, who is a young scientist at Tashkent State Agrarian University, Uzbekistan. And the title of his talk is The Features of Non-Traditional Crops in the Agricultural Production of Uzbekistan. I request our speaker to please raise his hand so that our camera can capture him. Dear friends, it's my pleasure to, to attend second SEO Young Scientist Conclave. My name is Anwar Shamsiv. I am working at the Samarkand branch of Tashkent State Agrarian University as assistant professor of the Department of Crop Science and Horticulture. Let me introduce my topic about the features of non traditional crop in the agricultural production of Uzbekistan. <coughs> First of all, I would like to talk about Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, located in the central part of the Central Asia, which is bordering with five countries, with Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan. Uzbekistan has 448,978 square kilometers total area. Among this, cultivatable land is 4.5 million hectares, or about 10% of Uzbekistan total area. Agriculture is an important sector of Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan's economy, counting for approximately 25% of GDP and employing about 26% of the labor force. Uzbekistan is one of the most favorable regions for growing agriculture as well as industrial crops. There are some main crops which is cultivating in agricultural sector in Uzbekistan. There are cotton and wheat and corn, rice, different type of vegetables and different type of fruits and also melons and watermelons also are very famous and also one of the ancient sectors of agriculture is silkworm breeding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there are many, nowadays there are many negative impacts of climate change on agriculture in Uzbekistan. One of the negative impacts in Central Asia is the fastest increases in average annual temperature near the Caspian Sea, in the Aral Sea area and the southern desert regions of the Central Asia, the southern part of Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. This increase in temperature has great difficulties in the cultivation of crops, especially in summer, a sharp increases in air temperature negatively affects the potato harvest and potato growers facing many problems. Potatoes for the 2022 harvest in all categories of farm in Uzbekistan are planted on 243,000 hectares and average yield was 16.9 ton hectares. It's very uh, low. That's why 
as a cultivation of sweet potato as a crop that is resistant to high temperature and can replace potato and help ensure food security for the population in the future. Sweet potato is a rich in antioxidant called beta carotene, which is very effective at raising blood levels of beta vitamin A, particularly in children. Sweet potatoes are nutritious, high in fiber, very filling and delicious. They can be eaten, boiled, baked, it, steamed it, or fried. Sweet potatoes are usually orange but also found in other colors such as white, red, pink, violet, yellow and purple. In the agriculture of the Uzbekistan, the fact that sweet potato is a non-traditional crop in large-scale scientific activities and projects are being carried out to increase the yield and quality of the crop based on a comprehensive study of non-traditional crops, the selection of promising varieties of sweet potatoes and the development of the system of agrotechnological measures aimed to at obtaining a high and cheap harvest is relevant and has important scientific and practical significance under the condition of in different regions of Uzbekistan. The purpose of the study was a comprehensive assessment of the collection of 18 varieties of the sweet potatoes introduced in different countries of the world in terms of all maturity, growth and development, crop formation, productivity and keeping quality of tubers on their basis to identify promising varieties and develop a system of agrotechnological measures that to increase the yield and quality of crop. The scientific novelty of the research is as follows. For the first time, collection of sweet potato varieties were assessed in a comprehensive manner in terms of seedling yield, oil maturity, growth and development, accelerated reproduction, crop accumulation, trade, yield compactness of tubers in the nest, total and marketable yield, biochemical composition and to uh, keeping quality of tubers in the condition of Samarkand region. And on their basis promising varieties have been identified and agricultural technology has been developed to obtain a high commercial yield. Based on a comprehensive study of the selection of promising varieties of sweet potato and the development of a system agriculture technological measures aimed at obtaining a high and cheap harvest. Three new varieties of sweet potato have been entered into the state register of Uzbekistan which allows those sweet potatoes varieties to grow all regions of the country. And also for the farmers, for the growing sweet potato, the recommendation was established which including the agricultural technology with planting between the 10th to 13th of April and also mulching with a film was introduced for the growing of sweet potato varieties. As a result, a sweet potato yield per hectare of 50 to 55 tons was achieved. During the study, we received grant funds from the government for our startup project, which is focusing to production of antioxidant rich sweet potato flour. And now the practical work on the production of sweet potato flour is ongoing. This was a pilot project with budget around $10,000. And nowadays, we are starting second stage with a budget $100,000, uh, which means uh, growing such kind of not traditional crops like sweet potato. It can be uh, make valuable products from the tubers. This is all my presentation. I wanted to discuss with you. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Shamsiev, for a very good presentation. Now we will proceed to the last speaker of this session, who is Dodo Yang. She is a young scientist yeah. at Shangzi University of Technology, China. And the title of her talk is High Value Development and Mining of Utilization Potential of Medicinal Plants. I request Dr. Dodo to please switch on her video.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to share my research work to you. Uh, and I'm Dou Dou Yang from Shanxi University of Technology of China. What I'm going to share with you today is high value development and my of utilization potential of medicinal plants. With the progress of science and technology, clinical advantages of medicinal plants have been gradually revealing and the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 have witnessed the significant role of medicinal plants. So based on computer-aided learning and high throughput mass spectrometry, our research interests mainly focus on high value development and efficient utilization of non-medicinal parts of the medicinal plant, and exploration on pharmacological effects, mechanism, and product development of medicinal plants. As we know that most of medicinal materials are only limited to traditional organs or parts of the plant, but many studies have proved that the non-medicinal parts usually contain active substances. So they usually have high value of research and utilization. How to use these resources efficiently, reasonably, and economically is of vital significance. One example of our former research is called Dobson's Pinocena. It is a medicinal plant widely used in China and Asian countries. The traditional medicinal parts are only limited to the roots, but the above ground parts, including stems, leaves, and flowers, contain large numbers of chemicals, so they actually have high development potential. But until now, uh, the above ground parts haven't been utilized well. So, we made comparative analysis on the leaves and the roots. It found that uh, uh, the leaves contain higher content of uh, polyphenols and flavonoids and even amino acids. We found that the uh, levels of polyphenol in the leaves can reach as high as that of 11.84, but in the roots are only 0.40. Uh, and so as for the flavonoid content, Interestingly, uh, they considered pharmacological chemical uh, named uh, lofini uh, here uh, in the roots are only 0 0.23. And we identified this chemical in the leaves. And uh, the levels in it is uh, uh, 0 0.28 higher than the, in the uh, roots. So we made further uh, UPLC mass mass identification, and we identified 52 uh, phenolic acids and 55 flavonoids, 22 polychloride and 14 alkalides. And we believe that uh, in the future time, we can identify more chemicals uh, when the technology improved. So uh, we suppose that uh, uh, these materials are very good materials with the uh, high uh, antioxidant uh, effect because uh, it has high levels of polyphenols and flavonoids. Therefore, we conducted an experiment on inhibit the uh, free radicals. It finally turns out that uh, the water extractor and ethanol extractor of the leaves can inhibit DPGH and ABTS uh, free radicals very efficiently, which can uh, approach the effect of uh, VC and uh, no concentrations of uh, 100 to 150 um, milligram per milliliter. Um, and uh, then we conducted an in vitro experiment in N2C elegance model. Uh, we found that the water extractor uh, of the uh, leaves uh, of Cardopsis showed significant anti-aging effect and antioxidant effect in improving the lifespan of uh, the C elegance uh, by increasing the lifespan of uh, 7.10 to 18.88. Uh, interestingly, uh, the water extractor of the leaves transfer uh, the groups treated with the leaves transfer the expression of DEF16 in the uh, cytoplasma to nucleus. And uh, uh, the uh, materials activated downstream target genes and up 
regulated the expansion of SOD3 gene, which is an uh, important gene, uh, gene in uh, antioxidant. And we then conducted an uh, experiment of uh, anti uh, fatigue effect uh, with the water extractor of the leaves. And we found that the groups treated with the water extractor of the leaves can pronounce the spinning time of the mice very efficiently. And the results of physical and chemical indexes of uh, blood and the liver of the mice uh, were consistent with the results of swimming test. Uh, and uh, the groups treated with the water extract of the leaves directly upregulated the functional genes of uh, PCG1 alpha and PCGA alpha and MHC1 genes in AMPK signaling pathway. Um, so we consider that the materials are good materials with a uh, uh, very good uh, functional effect. We process the leaves into tea according to Chinese gray tea procedure. And this product is with a high sensory quality. This is our product. Uh, in addition, we think in the future, we want to develop the leaves, stems, and flowers uh, of this plant into antioxidant in food preservation and cosmetics. And we have published some papers and got some awards of Chinese government. Another uh, research focus of our research team is the exploration on pharmacological effects and product development. Achievements have been made in the development of antimicrobial activity of a plant named the Dandelion, this plant. And we have acquired two uh, patents uh, in developing the um, plant extractor for, treat, uh, the, 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 for, for, for treating acne and for treating dry ecological inflammation. This is the product developed uh, from Daddy Nine for treating acne. Uh, we found some uh, uh, volunteers to try our product. It turns out that our product has very good effect for treating uh, acne, and it can even repair the damage of the skin caused by the acne. Uh, this is the picture. Another product uh, developed from Daddy Nine is uh, uh, for treating dry ecological inflammation, because our product has very good inhibitor effect on gardenarina vaginalis and the bacteria of uh, Candida albicans. Uh, from this picture, we can clearly see our product has efficient uh, effect. Uh, when the concentrations are different. And we have published two papers of this, and we have applied for a patent from Chinese government. This is our research team. Welcome to join us uh, in developing the uh, product and other research. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dodo, for a very nice presentation. Now we will proceed to the question and answer session. The participants here in the auditorium who have questions can raise their hands and our volunteers will come to you with the microphone. And the online participants can type in their questions in the chat box along with the speaker's name to whom their questions are directed and our AV team will relay them to us. Thank you. Do you have any question? Please raise your hand. Thank you. Maybe I will have the um, uni um, the universal um, question for all participants, and I would like to ask all participants from this section about the um, assessment for your technology for Etigdon. What do you think about it, and uh, what do you think is it possible, or would it be interesting for you to work and to develop your technologies in the Etig zone? Beyond the polar uh, cycle, for example. Polar cycle. Beyond the polar cycle. Thank you for your question. Uh, 
I, I, I will try to answer from my topic. Uh, for growing of sweet potato is why I said no tradition for Uzbekistan. Up to now, sweet potato was not growing in, in our re region. Uh, sweet potato actually is tropical and subtropical crop. And we tried to grow it using mulching technology to uh, increase the soil temperature. And it can good effect to grow it in our region. Uh, nowadays, uh, I searched some information in Kazakhstan also they're trying to grow it. Uh, but it needs some techniques like mulching and other techniques. Uh, but the north part of Russia, maybe it's not possible. Maybe it's possible in the, inside the greenhouse maybe. But it has very high yield except in potato in for example nowadays farmers from our country they are getting from normal potato like 25 tons of uh, potato they say it's good but i recommend you can get two times more yield from sweet potato same area but uh, two times more yield and they were surprised and nowadays uh, there are three regions they are starting to grow in sweet potato it's uh, more comfortable for farmers also. And one more thing, uh, as sweet potatoes new type crop, there are no insects right now. Like in potato, you know, many diseases and viruses, uh, but uh, in our case, they are very low and it can uh, make good money from sweet potato. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I have a question to the previous uh, speaker, Dudu Yan. Um, I wanted to sh to uh, mention the significance of this research also. Uh, and um, I have a question if uh, after the patent uh, given the, to, you, to your uh, products, uh, can we already uh, implement it? Can we already <laughs> purchase it somewhere? And can you please tell this information to us? Uh, thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to know what kind of product you want, uh, the tea or the uh, anti-inflammation product? Uh, I could see many interesting uh, products about this, uh, uh, many uh, sk skin and, uh, um, uh, for this uh, anti-acne and uh, um, um, many other uh, your uh, products. So that's that's very good. Good if you could see, uh, could show nice results after the implementation of it. Uh, 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 okay, okay. I'll share my slide to you if I can find. Uh, let me try. Um, we developed uh, the product for treating acne and for treating the uh, dry uh, collagen inflammation. Uh, and we are now trying to develop new products. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in my product, I can send you the uh, introduction and the picture of my products. Mm, uh, could you uh, provide me with your email or... or other uh, contact uh, information. Uh, okay, thank you. So it's not in uh, in uh, production for all. I mean, people not yet. It's just. Uh, 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 I beg your pardon. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank I, you. I I I didn't uh, hear you uh, clearly. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to Bapadas, uh, a very wonderful presentation on trying to integrate the optical, thermal, and microwave remote sensing for uh, surface moisture. Of course, you have been trying to gather data from the remote uh, means and then trying to come out with models or give information. Uh, but uh, just as we have some ground truth data also to be taken when you are relying on the uh, satellite imagery data, having sensors in a particular location and trying to develop some information and provide information to the farmers on a real-time basis would save a lot of money 
in terms of the electricity being used to pump the water out and also conserve also the water which is being utilized beyond requirement. So trying to integrate the subsur subsurface moisture data from the remote sensing along with the ground truth data of having some sensors and also just like uh, weather advisory is providing information at a block level yes. could do really good because right now farmers are having access to smartphones. They rely on weather data. They are very much aware when they are going to have rains. So they are taking some decision. And this vital information on subsurface moisture, if it is provided, I think this goes at a very micro level. Any take on that, please? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, uh, we we have been working on uh, re retrieval of surface, subsurface and surface soil moisture, utilizing remote sensing data. So here my topic was on surface, but we have worked on subsurface soil moisture retrieval also. And we have collected ground truth data as I have uh, presented in my presentation around uh, 622 ground truth observations we have collected for uh, soil moisture, surface soil moisture. And recently IMD has established many automatic weather stations network throughout India. So their soil moisture sensor is there. So if that data is coming into open domain, we can use it as ground truth for a pan India level mapping of soil soil moisture, surface as well as subsurface. So, and uh, some products are also available from NASA, uh, that is SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive, though it is, in, uh, it is at a coarse resolution, 36 kilometer. So we are also trying to downscale that to at least one kilometer resolution. And coming to your suggestion regarding to agro advisories, agro based, uh, weather based agro advisories, yes, it's a very good uh, suggestion. If we can include soil moisture there, uh, and then it will be a great one. Uh, also, we are working on district agromet unit in our institute. So in many districts, it has been started by IMD in collaboration with ICR. So we are working on that. And their soil moisture is one of the component to improve uh, the irrigation or management related uh, decisions. So uh, in coming future, uh, we can see some kind of products on that. Thank you, Dr. Das. Hope to see it at block level at the earliest. It will benefit of yes, yes. farmers. Thank you. So I also have one question for uh, Dr. Das. Very nice presentation. And uh, I was very much interested in the machine learning part there. And it seems you have used different uh, machine learning models along with elastic net. Yeah. So uh, any particular reason you went to random forest or machine learning and not have not used elastic net? Uh, actually, uh, there were two levels actually, mm -hmm. what we have used. At level one, we have used base learners. Mm -hmm. In base learners, we have tried to use bagging, that is random forest representing, boosting, that is GBM, and one another tree-based technique, that is cubist. So these three techniques are very popular, mm -hmm. and uh, this has proved their efficiency or accuracy in, in various fields. So we have used those at a base learners. And then the output of those base learners were combined using elastic net okay, got as it. a meta learner. Got it, yeah. So that is, we called it as a stack ensembling. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more question for uh, Dr. Anwar uh, for sweet potato. Uh, so have you uh, also planned to increase the size of sweet potato uh, <laughs> so that uh, you can have more <coughs> quantity per, per potato? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, as I understand, you mean the size of tubers of yeah, yeah, yeah. sweet potato. Exactly. exactly. Uh, you know, there are many uh, differences between varieties. Uh, there are some varieties they have uh, big tubers, big size, but uh, uh, quantity is very small, like one, two tubers. Is okay. Some varieties, there are many tubers, but it's small size. That's why uh, our, for our research, we decided to learn 18 varieties, different varieties. And among this, we decided just three varieties, to, uh, with, which has high yield and uh, uh, resistant to high temperature and all so on. So the one which you selected, if you want yeah. to increase the size, that way, uh, with the same harvest, you will get more quantity. That's what yes, to yes. Ask. It's our future plan to uh, increase the uh, yield and uh, make some uh, other things. It's our future plan. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, one more question to Bob Das about data. Uh, what? uh frequency of data you say you say that you have some uh, several hundreds of estimations and how do you collect them uh 
at so one it is one question and uh, another question is uh, what did you do with noise data how do you prepare how did you pre-process this data and how you achieve the gold uh, ground true data set and uh, my colleague have a question about optical data what did you uh, how I is you used only NASA data or NASA you say okay. yes and uh, have you practice with uh, have you have a practice with uh, quadrocopters or some other data optical data okay. thank you quadcopter you want yes copters okay so uh, regarding your first question uh, we have collected the ground truth data using theta probe sensor one sensor is there for soil moisture estimation so we have used that you can use gravimetric method also for estimation of soil moisture okay and uh, we have tested some of the outlayers uh, means outlayer detection we have done it first to eliminate outlayers in the day present in the data so the, that i think answers your first question and coming uh, regarding to your second question optical data we have used landsat 8 that is freely available we have also used sentinel 2 from esa that uh, european space agency those freely available open domain data we have used we have not tried any uh, commercial data because it will be difficult for farmers or it will be difficult for us also to generate the products and give it to farmer if the data are having some cost. So we have used open domain data. And yes, we can use quadcopter also. But the special uh, coverage will be less using quadcopter. And uh, government of India is now uh, promoting use of drone for agricultural applications. So uh, I think every KBK, uh, this Kisi Vigyan Kendra is there. So the uh, government of India is providing drones for different agricultural operations. So in near future, we'll be having drones for uh, different agricultural applications also. Thank you. I have a question for Professor Yang. Uh, since you have shown that your extract is uh, has a different antioxidant and inflammatory properties, that way it is uh, working as an anti-acne. My point is like, you know, uh, could you standardize that what exactly are the constituents that are uh, responsible for these properties in your extract? And uh, my next question is associated with the same question is like, during different seasons, how can you make sure, because different seasons the plant can change the constituents, uh, the constituents in the plant extract can change, and how, how can you make sure that before going to uh, take as a product that your extract is like standardized it is not changing the constituents which are actually responsible for its properties thank you uh, and thank you for your question and we uh, we now uh, utilize EPLC mass mass uh, chemical identification to, uh, to identify more chemicals of our product uh, especially uh, nowadays, we have witnessed that the metabolism uh, chemicals uh, um, using uh, metabolism method uh, with a very large uh, chemical li li library. Uh, so <laughs> we can identify more chemicals with our product. But uh, um, in the future, I think we may identify more chemicals if the library, uh, the information of the library has been prompted. So, uh, so we first uh, need to try to the effect of our products. And then uh, <coughs> furtherly, we will uh, identify the chemicals uh, and, and uh, uh, maybe in the future, we will try more plants uh, to, 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 uh, try, to try them. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, I have one, one small question to Dr. Anwar again. Uh, you, we are uh, trying to introduce a new crop where it is not existing. A sweet potato was not there, you are telling. In the coming days with the climate change, you may have to go with the uh, several factors, not only in your place, in several countries. Uh, best alternate to crops. Uh, as a, in, in, uh, while introducing, what are the aspects we are keeping in mind in uh, convincing the farmers? Suppose and research aspects, we are suggesting something. What support of like um, uh, expectations from policy side, and how best you are uh, going to convince the farmers? we taking a very well established crops to the very uh, new crop. What are the your approaches? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for the first time, uh, 
all, uh, we're starting this uh, working on sweet potato from 2015. And nowadays we were, we are working very hard because to introduce to this crop for farmers, it's very difficult because they don't want to change uh, what they're doing right now. Even they get low yield, it's okay for them, but uh, it's coming very difficult. Uh, but we're trying to uh, introduce from uh, showing, uh, we got some uh, clusters, big clusters, they're they are ready to plant. And last three years, we are starting growing very big lands, uh, very uh, different regions. And farmers uh, looking for the result, for the yield, and nowadays they're starting change a little bit. But it takes some time for farmers to adapt, uh, and also it needs time uh, for population also. It's a new test for them, and uh, I hope in the future, like mm, five years or six years, it will be like cultivated more land in our farmers. Thank you. Uh. So the questions to Professor Amin. I think Professor Amin is online. Are you there, Professor? Yes, I'm online. Okay. So it was a very nice presentation, Professor. Uh, I have some queries uh, regarding the the peanut processing technology that you have presented. So, uh, can you tell me the because the use of the NR, even though it's a very repeat detections for quality testing of the peanut, but the from the cost benefit ratio, it seems to be very very you know costly. Mostly the farmers, the lemon people, they cannot uh, afford such kind of uh, uh, technology. Number one, number second is have you ever work on the the post-harvest diseases because after the harvesting a lot of disease infections will be there in the peanut i could see that mostly you are focusing on the the uh the compounds like the oleic acid the protein structure so can you tell me regarding this thank you yeah as we know the um uh, NIR is very uh, common and rapid uh, method for detecting the compounds in uh, peanut and other uh, plants, uh, and, and it, it works very useful uh, for the um, breeding uh, scientists and also the the, the um, uh, factory. Uh, so in our in our research, we try to. Um, Using the, the, the using the different varieties to first to build a, a database for uh, almost uh, three hundred almost uh, ninety percent uh, over ninety percent of uh, peanut varieties in China. Then we, we we can get the main data of the of the, the, the uh, peanut varieties. Then we using the AR method to get the uh, almost uh, mm, the main contents uh, like uh, the, the protein, fat, and also the, the uh, animal acids, and also the uh, other uh, very uh, not very uh, common compounds in, in peanuts. And uh, based on this uh, chemical data and the the the, the, the NIR uh, uh, data. We build the mathematical model, and uh, I, we, I, we also um, try to using some uh, maybe uh, verify verify model to get the the, the, the mathematical model more uh, efficiency. So uh, I think the, the, the for this uh, for this field, uh, our method can um, be Get, um, get the, the, the noise um, more and also can uh, use for it for to the uh, to the, the, the factory also for for the breeding uh, scientists in yeah then that's my that's my answer I don't know get to your your point yeah thank you 
Thank you. Okay. Thank In the you. interest of time, we won't take any more questions. Thanks all the speakers, both online and offline, for this session, for their engaging talks. Now we will break for tea and please get back to the auditorium around 11.30 so that we can start our next technical session. Thank you all. Thank you.